best songs, good music in other words, good rhythmic music. So I put that together and that's how my little movie got built up because things were happening. I had a camera that I got in the mail because I had used some credit card. Really, it was a little junky black camera, but it shot film and I just kept on shooting. I didn't have a decent camera for years. So anyway, um, and where were we? You wanted Speaking to Speaking about some of the, uh, the, the elements that might have been considered very radical that they were uncomfortable with. I don't think they liked it that so many women were out there digging those holes, putting those poles in, boards up, uh, just clearly invested in making a windmill. They didn't like it at all. And I think it's silly. And now I don't think it even matters to a lot of people. But um, it did then. And, you know, and we, I think we got the reputation that the windmill, the little house that we built that was at, at in the top of these poles where the, the actual blades went up over that, um, they thought we were out there just having a lesbian bacchanal or something, you know. Far from it. No, no. And, um, but we did play Nina Simone really loud did stuff like that. So it was a great um, broadcast system, the windmill was, yeah. yeah. Um, you talked to Diana Pace yesterday, uh -huh. and she said to ask you yeah. what you said when she went and talked to some administrators and you really let them have it. Those are her words. Hmm. <laughs> Well, I just shot my mouth off all the time, so I don't know exactly what she means, which ones I'm... She said it was just before you left. Huh. Well, they had this, she was there, or she heard that, I made a recording of them firing me, okay? And she heard that, and I think that's what she's thinking of. And, um, they, and then when they do this, they had students involved in it and faculty and um, pros and cons, supposedly. So they, their rationale for firing me was I wandered too far from my area, which means I was not teaching painting and drawing. You know, I was teaching art as art as they lived it when they put up Stonehenge. That was my anchor in uh, art history. Is that if a somebody was going to make an art piece now, it should be modeled on that idea, that it should reflect nature and culture. So I had a perfect rationale for all this, but you know, nobody wanted to hear it. The students heard it, most of them, but a lot of them thought we were crazy too, and they were mad because there were so many women involved in doing all the stuff, and the usual little trivial crap happened as well as big ideas, you know. But it was timing, you know, all, all the stuff was going on on the TV every night. Somebody was coming out or talking about women's issues or whatever issues, and it, it was, it, the whole thing was timing. It really was. You say you had recorded um, when they were firing you, uh -huh. is that correct? Do you uh -huh. still have the recording? I wish. You know, my technology is always a piece of junk that maybe works or not. And I was able to make a tape of it. That's what Diana heard. But I was not able to save the damn tape. Yeah. Well, it wasn't exactly them firing me as much as me telling them why I did what I did on the tape. And they would ask me some questions. And the actual firing took place somewhere else with a bunch of men and then Merrill Roden, do you remember him? Yes. He called me up to say they decided to let me go. Yeah. And it was after you had explained your... Oh, God, yeah. They knew what I was doing and why I was doing it. By far, they knew. And now, it's, do you, act, do, you do stuff like this? Well, then, sure, let's hire her. But then it was, mm, get rid of her. It's all, it's all timing, you know, all timing. So what were some of the reactions to 
some of the, the administration, or well, you talked about the reactions to some of the, the administration, but what about some of your colleagues in regard to what you were teaching? Well, Barbara Gibson was on my side always, and Linda Smith, who played a big role in this. She was a philosopher, and um, she, do you, have you heard of Mary Daly? She had gotten hold of Mary Daly, gotten a lot of her material, and had, you know, essentially developed a whole psychology around women's issues of, and philosophy, because she was a philosopher. I can put you in touch with Linda if you want to, yeah. She's down in Missouri. She lives on a farm with a bunch of animals. Very happy. Um, and Sherry Redding, too, helped with that. Uh -huh. So overall, your colleagues were supportive? Well, the ones I'm mentioning were supportive. I'm sure there were others that just thought, oh, get her out of here, you know. What about your students? Did you keep in touch with them, uh, find out how they felt about what was going on? Yeah, I would hear from them. Whether I, I didn't go out and look for it, but I would hear from students and, um, you know, I could just tell. They knew. They'd even probably been in situations like that before in other schools where some, quote, radical teacher was telling the truth and was getting in trouble for it and shown the door. Because there was a big, uh, very strong push to keep things the same and Christian and right and don't change anything. And these women were for change, you know, at a deep level. And so they would find ways to shut us up and get rid of us one way or the other. Yep. How well was TJC, this, this, your TJC, yeah. known outside of West Michigan? How oh, did that's a good question. Come? You know, Elaine Delcher could tell you more about that because um, she was telling me not long ago that she had she was down in Latin America somewhere and hooked up with a gang of students and they were all on their way up here to go to TJC. So it was like a underground uh, rumor about this incredible college in Michigan that he should go to and a lot of them would turn up. I don't know how many others aside from her were part of that underground thing, but I'm sure there were. And um, that would be so interesting if you could get them all back together and find out how they knew about it and how they got in touch. She's, she's probably your best bet at following that up. Wow, that's really interesting mm -hmm. from that far away. That far away. As far as the courses that you were developing, um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the pedagogy involved. Well, I think Linda paid more attention to that issue than the rest of us. I was using uh, materials that I knew I, that were contemporary, that things that were being sent to me from California, from my spies there, from New York, because uh, I do have a whole raft of people that are quite far out and with it and would contact me and send me stuff. Barbara's one of them for sure. Linda, Terry Wolverton, who was a student briefly at TJC and then went to LA and became the person that ran the women's building there. That's the name you need, Terry Wolverton. Wolverton. Uh-huh, W-O-L-V-E-R-T-O-N. I still hear from her all the time. And, um, you know, she hooked up with Arlene Raven and Judy Chicago, who were dropouts from uh, the university there, the art school there. And they started the whole women's building, which was our way of teaching art, you know. And it was quite an interesting encounter. <laughs> all of us mixed together. Jesus. So, um, and where were we? Am I drifting off no, into reverie no. land here? Nope. Okay. 
Well, so I'm giving you the main names. That's yeah. because Trudy Chicago was here not long ago and gave a, a talk. I happened to catch it on TV. Yeah. It was in one of your um, venues. I don't know which, but somebody probably taped it. Yeah, I'm okay. sure. I bet because be I was watching it on tape. Well, now there was also the development of the program that became known as Women, World, and Wonder. Uh -huh. And could you tell me about the involvement in the start of that? That was to be the whole damn curriculum. That was what we cooked up in my basement <coughs> on Heritage Hill. Um, it really was to be, you know, psychology, philosophy, art all those things uh, just under that category and that you could sign up for that and get the whole thing and we had enough staff that would teach it and there were so many great books out by then too you know Phyllis, Phyllis Chesler was writing books that were very good um, Mary Daly oh, who else they're all still out there I think It'll, uh, it'll come to me. Could you describe how, if I were a student, yeah. how did I take the course? I mean, what was, you know, how did it work? Well, I think Sherry and Linda, too, probably sat down and actually figured out on paper what you would call it and how you would sign up for it, and um, just like you would any other course. So it was offered at Grand Valley. And it was the first, as far as I know, women's program course offered anywhere in this country. And when did that begin? The 70s. I couldn't tell you the exact year. If you talk to Sherry or Linda, they'll know. We'll talk to Sherry. She'll mm -hmm. know. She's here. Oh, good. Okay. <coughs> um, how long, how, I, I want to, I want people to get a sense of the course. In other words, did people sit in rows in a classroom and take notes? For the most part, yeah. Or was it circular, or how was there a different way that the, the room itself was set up? I think it was sort of up to the teacher and up to the students. If they felt like circling and talking across with each other, they did it. If they didn't, they didn't. The classrooms were ordinary, ordinary you know, table and chairs, and there was nothing in the, in the concrete setting that was unique. It was, it was school. We were going to school. <laughs> okay. Anything about that that you want to follow up with? Um, I'm searching for it. So give me a second. Sure. Okay, maybe we'll return to that. That's fine. In a moment. Oh, what is that noise? Yeah, okay. it's got to go 